Welcome to this pre-recorded Saturday Morning Physics Lecture. I'm Tim Chupp, a longtime host and organizer of Saturday Morning Physics. And before I introduce today's speaker, let me remind you that our speaker will answer your questions after the lecture. Please email your questions to physics at umich.edu. It's my pleasure to introduce today's lecturer, Professor Julie Young, who's a professor of Naval Architecture and Engineering and the recent director of the Marine Hydrodynamics Laboratory at the University of Michigan. Professor Young is an expert in maritime propulsion with her research focused on fluid structure interactions, novel materials, smart and adaptive marine propulsors and turbines, and smart energy conversion systems, along with many other topics. She came to the University of Michigan in 2009 after receiving her PhD from the University of Texas at Austin and after spending a number of years as a professor of single civil engineering at Princeton, uh, she came to Michigan. In addition to her teaching, research, and leadership here at Michigan, she is incredibly busy consulting government and industry on many aspects of naval engineering, including the Transportation Research Board of the National Academy of Sciences and the Society of Naval Architecture and Marine Engineering. She is the author of over 100 papers and proceedings and highly sought as a speaker including a number of keynote addresses for international congresses on marine transportation. So it's a great honor to welcome you to Saturday Morning Physics, and we're really looking forward to your lecture, Professor Young, entitled Smart Maritime Propulsion and Energy Harvesting Concepts. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, welcome, everybody. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. So uh, today's presentation is on smart maritime propulsion and energy harvesting concepts. I hope to get all of you excited about the various uh, opportunities in the maritime space. Um, so uh, much of this work uh, involve, uh, um, has been done by my students. And uh, my former student, Casey Hardwood, he's now a professor at University of Iowa. And my current students, Yun Tian Liao, uh, Menavendra Desai, uh, Jacob Wolves, and also Sarah Yurani. Um, so the, why are we interested in maritime transport? So the typical 70, 80, 90% rule. So 70% of the world is covered by water. 80% of the people live near the water and 90% of world transport goes to the water. So you can see the importance of maritime transport just by those numbers. Now, maritime shipping is actually the most efficient, carbon efficient form of transport by goods, as you can see from this plot here. Um, you, here we basically compare the transport efficiency. This is from IMO, the International uh, Maritime Organization, from different forms including uh, tankers on the top, and then you have trucks and you have airplanes, right? So this is gram per ton kilo mile. Um, and then you can also see that in terms of maritime transport, even though it is the most efficient, carbon efficient form of transportation of goods, it still accounts for approximately 2.1% of the world's CO2 emission. So there's a lot of room for improvement. And in addition, in addition to uh, carbon emission and cost, which I will elaborate in a little bit more, it's also challenging to operate in the maritime space because you have a free surface, you have wave, and you also have many different forms of uh, maritime platform. So you may have aircraft carrier, here's a tanker, and this last one, you will see a video of it, is a uh, high speed, uh, planning vessel, maybe something that you will see in a James Bond movie, for example. So when you design this type of hull, you have to make sure that there's significant impact force. And then also, if you're the one riding on it, you probably want to be very careful because your neck can snap if the bounce is too much, right? So we also have to ensure the safety of the operator on the vessel. So, um, 
IMO, the International Maritime Organization, the 2020 requirement, we actually have a new energy efficient efficiency design index, what we call EEDI. Um, it's basically applicable to ships over 400 tons, new ships, uh, and the requirements to reduce the sulfur and CO2 emission by 30 to 50 percent by 2022. So this is uh, very important and very new, and there's a lot of challenges in terms of meeting it, but we all want to do that. So we want to do that not only for the emission standard, but also for the ship owners, it's also in terms of cost. So just to give you a comparison for a modern container ship, about it costs approximately about $43.7 million per year in fuel costs. So this is based on 2018, publication numbers that you see in this reference here. And the, basically for every 0.5% improvement in power efficiency, the savings is about $0.2 million per ship per year. So this is 2018 where the uh, price of gas has went down quite a lot. Now, if you go back to 2016 or 2015, it would have been higher, right? So it's in the interest of our planet, is in the interest of our um, uh, life on the planet in general, and then also the safety and cost to really reduce the carbon fuel emission. Now, um, in terms of the complexity of maritime operation, I just want to use this slide to showcase some of the challenges that we have. So basically, if you just talk about, in this case, is a, a combatant craft, you have to, it has wind force, right? Particularly if you think about some of the uh, ferry ships. So you, um, or uh, you probably want to be out on the deck. So they actually have a pretty tall uh, portion of the body above the water. And you really have to be careful about the stability of the vehicle. And the wind can come in varying directions. And so is the wave. So it has to operate at sea. And at sea, sometimes we have very significant sea states where you can have waves several meters high, right? Um, and also the wave can have a lot of different periods. And if you think about the vessel, it has to power itself at sea is basically everything is within it. And then it also has to maintain its integrity and the comfort for the people on the vessel. And if you think about all the different structures, the geometry is very complicated. So for example, you will see a bulbit's bow and quite a lot of uh, designs that really helps to reduce the wave drag. You also see like bilge kills to ensure stability of the vessel. And then you also see, for example, you definitely have rudders so that you can maneuver. And then you have the propulsor. So just to give you a sense of the complexity of uh, maritime transport. Now that's just on the hull. I specialize on a lot of propulsion system. And here I use this slide, it's very busy, to showcase the examples of the different kind of propulsors that you may see on a marine vessel. I know a lot of you may not have actually looked at the back of a vessel to see how does the propulsor actually look like. So I thought this may be interesting. So on the top left here is a traditional fixed pitch propeller along with the rudder. And then the one right next to it is actually a controllable pitch so that basically you can adjust the angle of attack effectively according to flow so that you have more efficient performance. And then you also see ducted propulsor in the case if you wanna protect the propulsor and then also if you worry about acoustic performances. And then if you do high speed vessel, so like if you guys watch James Bond movies, for example, or if you want to go really fast, you know, like, um, for example, if you want to go more than uh, 60 knots, 60 knot to 100 knot, and if you're lightweight, you tend to use a surface piercing propeller. So these type of propeller, basically, the, they operate a uh, majority of it is above the water. So only the water line should be right beneath the hub. And the whole idea is that you reduce the drag uh, on the appendages. That's because drag is proportional to velocity square. So if you increase speed, your drag increase substantially. So if you reduce the wetted area, you can significantly increase the efficiency. You also have some quite some interesting devices. Like for example, here, this is actually a tunnel thruster. 
This allows you to maneuver. So you put on forces, allow you to maneuver the vehicle. And this is actually an underwater vehicle. And then you also have uh, counter-rotating propellers to recover the swirl so that you have a 4 to 5% increase in efficiency. And you also have other forms such as water jet or axial jet. And the whole idea is you suck the uh, water in to the uh, entrance here and then spill the water out in the behind. Some of you may have seen this, for example, uh, when you operate a water ski, a lot of them, some of them use water jet. And they tend to be efficient for high, highly loaded condition and for higher speed. Um, you may also have some potted configurations. So those allow really good maneuverability. So you can rotate this pod. Some of them can even be rotated 360 degree. And then this one is actually what we call a cycloidal propeller or Voigt Snyder propeller, and is good for tugs for maneuvering. So you, so you can see quite a lot of options and you can see that just the geometry itself is quite complicated. So a lot of my work, uh, focus on developing smart, adaptive marine propulsors, energy saving and energy harvesting devices that can actively or passively change shape or morphology and material property to based on the flow condition or based on changes in your mission requirement. Um, so the objective is to enhance the efficiency, of course, uh, to increase the range of operation of uh, improve the agility and also the safety, right? And also uh, we want to, um, the objective in terms of the research side is to advance the basic understanding of the physics that govern the fluid and the structural response, as well as the stability of the propulsor and the ship together as a whole. In multi-phase flow, the reason when we say multi-phase, of course we have air, and we have water just because of the presence of the free surface. But you'll see a little bit that we can also have vapor. Um, so I will show some videos with that. So why do we want things to have, for example, just even simple change in shape? So if you think about a traditional propulsor, the, it have one, if you think about a traditional propulsor or a foil, it's efficient at one angle of attack, but if your flow changes, it's no longer efficient. So that's why you want to be able to enable active or passive change in shape. One possibility is using a controllable pitch propeller. So if you see over here, you can actually change the pitch at the root, but it actually requires hydraulic actuators. And it's, if you imagine a propeller, some of them can be quite big, right? Like 20, 40 feet. And the low in the water is very high because water density is about 850 times denser than that of air. So if you need an actuator that can uh, change the pitch very fast, typically like for a combatant craft or a tanker, for example, your propeller typically operates at around 100 RPM. And if that's the case, you don't have an actuator that can uh, change the shape fast enough as the blade rotates in the cycle. So that's why we want something that is more passive. So one thing that I have been working on personally is composite marine propulsors that take advantage of material and isotropy. So the shape automatically change right at the tip, the only place that where you really need it. And it's just by small degrees, like about two degrees, so that it unloads uh, near the tip at higher speed to avoid some of the performance decays. And if you think about why do we want adaptive composite, you don't need to look any further than nature. So example, you may have a manta ray. And if you look at the manta ray or any fish, you can look at tuna, you can look at shark, is actually composite, right? So in, in another word, the material have multiple layup and where you have dense areas, very dense fiber areas and less dense fiber areas, and the orientation of the fiber are different. And then also it has muscle so that it's, it's flexible. And then it's active, it's controlled by uh, its, its uh, neurological structure within the biological, within the, um, within the uh, ray. So in addition, if you also think about like when I say smart, 
what I want is I want to include embedded sensor into it so that, for example, it can be used for condition-based maintenance. Uh, one very simple example, your car. If you just think about five years ago, we have to bring our car in to change oil, for example, every half year. But nowadays, you don't do that anymore. You change oil when your car tells you to. Right, and we don't need to change oil as often. So nowadays I change my oil maybe once every one or one and a half year, whenever my car tells me to, depending on how do I drive. And that's the same idea for ship. And that's even more important for ship because in order to do a lot of the maintenance, we need to dry dock. So logistically, it's a very complex and very expensive matter. So if we can only do the maintenance when it's necessary based on sen sensor input, that really helps. In addition, if we have a lot of sensor input, like for example, if we know what is the operating condition, what, how does the uh, wave feel and wind feel is changing, um, then we can uh, reroute so that we can improve the safety, don't run into a problem. And then also we can, um, uh, we can also increase the efficiency, right? Avoid very heavy sea state area. Um, another example is like if you want completely autonomous ships. So, for example, if you were operating in the Arctic, is the logistic of operating there is actually very challenging. You have, for every vessel, there's about three support vessels. And if one of them fell and then you got to dry dock somewhere, you have to find a port that you can do so. So it's really useful to have autonomous surface or subsurface vessels. And then particularly for subsurface, then you don't have to risk the safety of the operator. I'm a scuba diver, so I know there are limits that you can do operate in water. Um, so how does a fish work? The fish actually have a lot of sensors. So a fish is actually a perfect example of a multifunctional composite lifting body that can operate, that can not only generate thrust and it can generate rapid maneuvering, right? Particularly when it's trying to evade uh, a prey, um, but also um, it can utilize the self motion to detect obstacles and use the flexible lifting surfaces and muscles to control the flow. One example of that would be a Mexican blind cave fish. So it's actually blind but it can maneuver perfectly in the cave without running into the wall. And how it does that is basically it has superficial, uh, basically on the surface neural mass that basically act as displacement sensors. And then it has a canal neural mass basically beneath the skin that acts as pressure gradient sensors. So when you go over a bump, you feel it. And by the way, same idea on how cockroach and mice and all these kind of different bugs work. They have different kind of sensors. And you can think about other type of sensors like acoustic, maybe a dolphin have very good acoustic sensors, right? So we want to use embedded sensors to give, to make the propulsor self-aware, make it smart. And then that will enhance the decision-making process on what you need to do. So now is actually the time why, to do that because there has been significant improvements in terms of material event. We have made a lot of advances in new materials and then also in 3D manufacturing. So the example so shown on the top left-hand corner is actually a 3D tape layering robot, a large scale version on um, curved surfaces, right? And the one on the top right-hand corner is actually a recent work by Professor Sridhar uh, uh, Koda of the Mechanical Engineering Department at University of Michigan. He, this is actually, he tested on a Gulfstream 2 on the wing. So instead of having uh, flaps that you guys see if you sit on the uh, window edge of the plane, what you, um, the problem with the flat is that you have discontinued, you have joints, right? And, and that in water, we really actually don't want that because what happened is you always have marine growth. You have things that grow around the hinges and then that can stop it from performing. Um, and also you can run into some of the phenomena that we have in water, such as cavitation. But so what he had done for the airplane is for the airplane wing is that he used a flexible composite skin 
And he enabled continuous change in the angle of attack here that you can see in this video. So this is only possible by taking advantage of uh, advances in material and manufacturing technique. And I think they have been looking into for this for wind turbine as well to reduce the noise and to enhance the performance. Now on the uh, lower right hand corner is an example of a 3D printing from Autodesk using additive manufacturing technique. We can nowadays print very, very complicated structures without any problem and that allows us to really optimize the design. In addition, there has been a lot of advances on sensing and control. So for example, we can embed fiber break braiding sensor very easily on composite. A collaborator of mine in uh, University of New South Wales in Australia, they managed to do 3D tape layering together with printed uh, fiber optic sensors um, in, for a composite body and is completely embedded and you have excellent control. Another advance in sensing is, for example, this is another work by um, uh, folks here at University of Michigan, so uh, Jintan Dani, and he have basically developed these really micro mini hydrophones, um, or pressure transducers effectively, which is like have a very small footprint. You can see that this is a penny, and you can see that it's actually smaller, thinner. Um, the footprint is only 1.4 by 1.6 by 0.5 millimeter, very thin, and then very small, and it can have a range up to 50 megapascal. So why do you care about such high pressure? You have to remember, if you wanna operate very deep in the water, your pressure is very, very high, right? And then it has a, a high resolution and bandwidth. So what, if you can imagine, since the footprint of this is so small, if we embed a lot of them on the cell, on the rudder, on the surface of the propeller on the hull, we can get a lot of information. So basically we get our displacement and our pressure transducer so the body can act as a fish, right? So now there has been a lot of, um, in terms of uh, ad applications of adaptive blades or foils, it's not new. It has been used in aerospace, for example, and in wind energy devices. So for example, helicopter blades, people have talked about using adaptive blades to improve the stability and to reduce the dynamic loads, okay? And then for wind turbine, you can see that this turbine actually looks a little bit different than your traditional turbine. Look at the tip of the blade is actually slightly curved. This is the star turbine. So it we call this the sweep, and then it's designed basically to, um, it flex a little bit at the tip, so your angle of attack changes. This is to reduce the fatigue damage on large scale turbines. Um, Similar idea have been proposed for marine current turbines. One of my former students, um, Michael Motley, at, uh, he's a professor at University of Washington. He has been looking into this area by using composites to increase the energy capture, as well as to reduce the fatigue damage of marine current and or tidal turbines. Now, um, this is an example of a composite propeller. So this is actually made with carbon and glass fiber uh, composite. And um, this is uh, for more of a naval propeller shape. And then this is a composite uh, surface piercing propeller. And you can see, you can, this is a relatively small vessel and you get, can get a sense of the size because that's me right there. Um, all right, so, um, now, even though there's a lot of applications in very similar applications in air, and we're doing very similar things in water, but there are significant differences. And the reason why is because if you just look at the geometry, look at the helicopter blade, and look at a typical wind turbine blade, they're very long and linear. And that's because the air density is a lot lower than in water. In water, the water density is a lot heavier. So you know when you try to swim, instead of just walking in air, right? It's much harder if you walk in the water. And so the, since the low is higher, then, it's, then the stress is also higher. And then if you look at a lot of these structures is effectively cantilever, so you definitely don't want it to break. And hence in water, the lifting body, if you just look at this propeller, what we call the aspect ratio. So the span to the cord length is a lot smaller. So in water, things tend to be a lot more stubbier. 
Okay. In addition, there's differences in interior layup. So in air, the weight is really important. So you want to minimize the weight as much as possible. So they tend to have hollow architecture or foam core type of architecture with spars. In water, the loading is so high, we typically have solid interior layup. So the way that you develop and generate and, and build the composite is different and how you optimize it. In addition, a lot of the time the marine propulsor is in the aft portion of the ship because that's where near your engine. And then also you want to, um, typically you don't want your ship to be operating bow down, right? You want to slightly bow up. So this is the reason why the propulsor is behind the, um, in the aft portion of the ship. And then the, the, the um, weight of the ship or the boundary layer, the blockage caused by the hull, the flow coming into the propeller is highly non-uniform. And because of that, the geometry of the propeller need to be optimized so that you can really maximize the efficiency. So um, in addition to the presence of free surface and wave, there are two additional phenomena that are unique in water um, or any fluid, any uh, liquid in general that makes it complicated, the, the design and analysis process more complicated. One example is hydrodynamic captation. So I think everybody is familiar with boiling, where you basically, you boil the water by increasing the temperature to 100 degrees Celsius. So captation is also the formation of bubble, but is by reduction in pressure. So you have a phase change from uh, liquid to vapor, in here by reducing pressure. And those of you who are familiar with hydrodynamics, the pressure reduces with an increase in speed squared. So the higher the speed, the lower the pressure, and the more lightly that you can form captation. So what happens when a bubble form is pretty benign, but what happens when the bubble claps? When that bubble claps on the surface, it can really cause a lot of pitting damage. So if you look at the back of a, if you look at the propeller on the back of a yacht, for example, you probably see like pitting of the ping. Actually, cavitation, that micro jet can have velocity somewhere between 200 to 900 meter per second. So it can really cause a lot of damage. It can generate shock wave and it can also cause delamination within the composite. So, and the cavitation can come in different forms. So this is bubble cavitation the sheet cavitation, cloud cavitation, tip vortex cavitation, it can cause a lot of noise. And the problem is, let me show you an example of cavitation. So this is uh, what we call unsteady sheet cloud cavitation on a foil. So you can see that the bubble forms a lot of bubbles, right? It grows, claps, grows, and claps. And now that you can imagine that the load to be changing quite significantly with that, in addition, what I did in this experiment, this is by collaborating with um, the Australian Maritime College and the Defense Science Technology Group in Australia, where we did this experiment there. And this is by putting a camera on the side. So this is in a flow loop. And then the other thing we did is putting a camera right underneath the flow loop. So here I'm looking at the tip part of the foil from underneath. And this is a composite foil and listen to what happens. So you can see that the flow, because the unsteady cavitation caused a lot of uh, the unsteady low cause uh, flow induced vibration. You can definitely see that and you can hear that and you probably don't want that, right? Um, in addition, here's a, the, the photograph on the bottom is an example of cavitation pitting damage on the tip of the blade as well as on the root of the blade. So those fixes can be quite expensive. Um, all right, so another phenomenon that in addition to cavitation, we can also have ventilation. There, you see that video. So ventilation, instead of a phase change, it involves entrainment of air. And in this case, it draws air from the free surface. If you, and you see basically almost like a tornado type of structure I'm afraid that, one of that your gets blame drawn is... in. Um, that's yes, my voice. The... And this is done at the lab the at the University of Iowa. Yes. So the propeller is rotating and you see that water will be sucked down very soon. 
and the low can drop by 50 percent you see this and then it's high so unsteady that it can actually lead to significant shaft vibration and it can lead to blade damage um ventilation is also a concern for something like this this is uh the one in the front is my uh former student and uh alexandra so she actually uh plays third in the Pan Am games, okay? So she's a very, very good seller. This is on the NACRA. And I want, I go and play this video again. So if you look at where my cursor is, there's two foils underneath and they're a composite. And the design is actually very smart. How it works is since the lift is proportional to speed, square, the higher the speed, the greater the lift that you're going to get from the foil. And then you, that will lift your body up until it reaches an equilibrium. So basically it has to balance the weight, right? Now the foil on the left, you see that you see it uh, emer emerging. So it's coming out of the water a little bit, but what actually caused the crash is the one on the right. So this foil on the right, what happened is it ventilate. Air got drawn down, like similar to that video before. And all of a sudden, the load dropped by half. And if you have two foil, the one on the right, all of a sudden the load dropped by half. And this can happen in less than a second. You'll flip because of the difference in the load. And um, the crash can be very severe. I know people who got their fingers cut off because the rope just tear the finger off. And this is actually, you see all these ropes in the front is actually called a human cheese grater. So if, I know it's not very pleasant, right? So <laughs> you definitely don't wanna be there because she actually, she was lucky when it crashed, she didn't land in the ropes, but she got caught underneath. And then, but she was able to free herself. So let me show you that video. So you see that this, there's two foils, this foil is emerging, but this foil, watch, right there, that's when it ventilates. So you see the, um, all of a sudden you see white foam and that's because air got drawn in and it, and it caused the sudden drop in load. So what causes ventilation? So ventilation requires uh, the presence of a low pressure and low momentum region that's prone to ventilation. So such as a separated region. So how you can tell, so this is one advice that I gave to one of the America's Cup team, is that if you actually uh, paint, put pink dots on your body and you can use a mixture of artist, um, or artist paint plus linseed oil. And then basically, um, if you put pink dots on, you can get the flow pattern. You may not be able to see it with a camera, but if you actually put pink dots, you can see that there's a separated region right near the leading edge of the foil. So this is the nose and the free surface is here. And this is the trailing edge and this is the free tip. And you see the separated region here. And so when you have a separated region here, it makes it very prone to ventilation. Initially, there's a what we call a surface seal. So initially that separated region is closed off at the free surface because the free surface is a constant pressure surface. But if you have slight disturbance, like a small wave, that slight disturbance will grow what we call due to tater instability. And that's because of, of a light fluid, air, being drawn to a dense fluid, water. And that slight disturbances will grow. And then when that disturbance, when it forms little vortices that feeds air into below, and once it connects to the separated region, your ventilator cavity will just explode. Um, and, and because it provides a pad of air ingress. So now I can show you examples of high fidelity simulations. This is done by uh, using numerical flow analysis uh, done by in collaboration with Lidos. Um, so you can see on the top a video of the experiment. So a foil being told to the left. And what you see here is the vorticity contour. And you can see that air being drawn down here. And then when the air gets drawn down, it feeds the tip vortex. So you see that the tip vortex becomes aerated and that's why you can see it. And then that cavity, uh, that ventilated gas cavity really expands. And so this is a view from underwater. And now I'm going to show you a view from above the water. So if you look at, the, this is simulation and very expensive simulation, by the way. So you can see that when it's ventilated, basically it's open to the atmosphere. So you can 
see literally a giant hole and behind it you see significant spray. So if you actually look at one of these high speed jets, sometimes you see that white spray coming up and we call that the rooster tail. And that really reduces the efficiency, so we want to reduce that. So um, you can see the beautiful formation there, but uh, a for a lot of applications, you probably don't want that. If you go really high speed, sometimes you want to purposely induce ventilation to reduce drag. So, um, so that's one of the simulation. And I also want to show you how fast this phenomena can happen. So this video, so what I have here is the free surface. If you just think about this as a strut, we told it uh, toward to the left. And um, what we actually slow down the video by six times so that you can actually see it. So let me play that again. What you see here is air being drawn down to the trailing edge and it goes up to the low pressure region at the tip. So you see this air being migrated and boom, it explodes. And this is actually the measure instantaneous load for all six, you have three components of force and three components of moment, right? And uh, once it ventilates, the load literally just dropped by half and it happened really, really fast. And so once it ventilates, the load drops and if you can imagine you have two foil, you can really flip. And the same thing for a high speed vessel. So, um, and nowadays when you talk about high speed, we can design things 100 knots, 120 knots, right? Um, so now that you see some of the complications, so we have free surface, cavitation and ventilation. So we have some challenges, but there's also a lot of opportunity. So in order to develop smart ship systems and energy harvesting devices, um, what we, we need to look at four interconnected research area. One of course is on design and optimization. Dynamics and stability is really important for the lifting body itself, as well as for the vessel. Using advanced materials and uh, platforms are also another area. And then nowadays is also using big data and stochastic analysis. So what I want to do next is to show you examples of some of the work that we have ongoing related to these four areas. So relate to design and optimization or novel platform in general, I have been asked to uh, design um, amphibious vehicles. So this is a vehicle that can go from the deep water all the way up onto the sand, right? Um, that's why it's, and including go across the surf zone where the wave is collapsing. So if you look at the geometry of this vehicle, it's actually quite unique. It's symmetric forward and aft. And the design is so that if the wave crash on it, it can flip over and it can still work. And the other thing that is novel about it is the propulsor. So typically, if you look at a, typically when you look at ships, it can go forward and then to slow it down, you rotate the propeller in reverse. So it doesn't slow down that fast. So you cannot go forward and go straight backward. But with this type of propeller, we can. This is called cycloidal propeller. So you see the, it's a cross flow propeller. So this is the blades over here. And this is one example of what is in here. Okay. So basically the whole idea, if you look at a cross section, so let's say these are your four blades. If I change the, I adjust the blade pitch angle. So such that in this configuration, I generate lift. That's my red arrow vector. And if I change the pitch to this configuration, I generate thrust. So basically what this allows me to do, the cycloidal propellers allows me to do 360 degree vectoring of the thrust. And now if I have that for each propeller and I have four, so for example, if I adjust the pitch such that I give more thrust to the right two propeller versus the left two, I'll end up a yawing motion, I'll turn, right? And on another example is that if I give more lift to two of the propeller compared to the, my left two propeller compared to my right two propeller, I'll end up with a row. So I can get completely 360, I can get my six degree of motion completely uncoupled. So I can have a vessel that can go straight forward, straight back, straight up, 
and straight down. And this is very unique. And this comes in handy if you want to do teaming. So if you want to send a swarm of um, robots underneath the water, and then you have to go to the surf zone where the wave is crashing, and you need to coordinate uh, with the other vessel, that kind of maneuverability is important. And so this is um, what you see here is this concept have been used in air. So this is in collaboration with uh, Professor uh, Mobile uh, from Texas A&M University. And he did this in air. You can see the little site. This is on a, a, a micro air vehicle and the smallest one can actually fit into your palm, right? So we try to apply the same concept in water, but it's harder in water because if you look at air, you don't have a body, right, really. But in water, you have this whole body and the couple motion makes it complicated. So what you see here in this video is a video of a, uh, of a preliminary test of the amphibious vehicle in our towing tank here in the Marine Hydrodynamics Lab at the University of Michigan. So in addition to, uh, to doing um, new design, we also need to analyze the motion. And this is how we can take advantage of uh, numerical simulations using computational fluid dynamics. So here's an example of a simulation by my student Jacob using Star CCM, And you can see this is a container ship, actually. So we only look at the without all the containers in this case. So this is an example of a simulation where you see the body motion and the contour is the pressure distribution in wave. So we can look at this detail and we can see, for example, if how do we need to change the bow shape so that we can uh, reduce the wave resistance? Uh, how should we change the stern geometry so that we up, improve the uniformity of the flow to the propeller and minimize the pressure pulses caused by uh, pressure uh, by the propeller that can cause a lot of discomfort and noise and how can we improve the stability of the vessel so this is how we can take advantage of the state of the art in terms of numerical simulation to study the detailed physics in addition, we can also do multidisciplinary design and optimization. So in the past, you see people that, you know, the people who designed the ship, they don't design the propeller, and the people who design the propeller, they don't design the control system. So now you can couple them together. In addition, people who do hydrodynamics, they didn't do the structures. But now, yeah, if you really want to do smart marine structures or aerospace structures, you need to consider the discipline all together. So here's an example. So this is a collaboration with Professor Kim Martins in aerospace engineering at University of Michigan. So he developed an aerostructural optimization tool for airplanes. Um, so basically you can optimize the fiber layup, for example, the material composition of the wing, as well as the geometry of the wing. And this he's using a uh, uh, what we call Euler fluid solver coupled with a finite element method with a lot of design variable. And it's actually pretty fast, 36 hours on a 435 processor, not too bad. And they were able to reduce the fuel consumption by 11.2%. So we apply the same tool in water. And we start with something more simple because this is um, new. So we did it for a foil. So on the right side is basically all the uh, orange points that you see is there are points to control the geometry. And then we optimize the geometry to maximize the efficiency, in another word, minimize drag for a given lift, and to avoid cavitation, and to uh, control the deformation and make sure that you ensure structural integrity or safety so that minimize the stresses. So, um, and it took 51 hours on 192 processor. And we actually did the first experimental validation of the code. What you see here is the uh, efficiency, basically the lift to drag ratio of the baseline. Uh, the baseline is the blue, or the blue result are the baseline. And that's uh, the, it's a taper hydrofoil. It's a little bit hard to see, sorry about that. It's the one on the top here, photograph. And then the optimized design is the one shown in red and is shown on bottom. So the plan form is exactly the same. The only difference between the top and bottom design is the cross-sectional geometry. 
Um, what is actually surprising is that the optimized geometry is actually thicker. Usually when you have a thicker body, you have more drag, but we actually get the opposite. If you look at it, the red curve are higher than the blue curve everywhere. So the optimized design is more efficient than the baseline at every single lift condition. So this may be if you have a rudder, the, so you have to go positive and negative angle of attack, and that's why a large range of lift coefficient. And the other nice thing that is that we demonstrated is how good the simulations are. So the experimental data are in symbols, and the numerical predictions are in lines. So you see that the blue symbols match with the blue line, and the red symbol match with the red line. So what we have shown here is that across a large range of loading condition, we achieve a 29% increase in overall efficiency, while the maximum increase in efficiency was 32%. Do you remember what I say earlier at the beginning of the lecture? So when I said every 0.5% um, uh, uh, increase in efficiency is $0.2 million per ship per year, right? So this can be very significant. And just to let you know, the baseline geometry was already quite efficient to begin with. So not only that we were able to increase the efficiency dramatically, we were also able to avoid cavitation. So if you look at the photograph on the top, that foil had significant amount of cavitation versus the one on the bottom had no cavitation. In addition, it's able to sustain three times the amount of load compared to the baseline. And because it's thicker, but the, it's thicker is fine, we optimize the geometry. So this is how you can take advantage of the state of the art computational fluid and structural dynamic uh, analysis and optimization technique. Another thing that we work on is junction details. So you probably can't think of any body that doesn't have a junction. So if you say the wing, the control surface, they, all, they are connected to the body, so you always have junction. And before, like if it relies on, when you use metal, it relies on um, welding, right? So people don't, you know, you, you use a weld, so that creates, smooths out the geometry in that portion, but you don't have good control of it. And it's probably not optimal for the fluid because you can form vortices there in separation or for the structure because it forms stress concentration. So what we can do now is we can actually optimize the junction design. So, and what we wanted to do is minimize the separation. So this is a T foil, maybe something that you see underneath an electric surfboard, or maybe something that you see that they use to lift up the hull for a high speed hull form. And, um, so you can see that there's a flow separation, reverse flow, uh, in the aft part of the uh, foil strut system. So this is the strut and here's the foil. And the orange section are flow separation areas. So we were able to optimize the design with complex to completely avoid the uh, flow separation. And nowadays with advanced 3D printing, we can get any geometry that we want so we can make highly optimized geometry cost effectively, all right? So this is with conventional material. Now we can also use advanced material. So for example, carbon and glass fiber composites. Um, so how we can take advantage of it, here's an example. So we actually did a test. This is collaboration with Australian Maritime College and also Defense Science Technology Group. We tested four different foils. On the right is a stainless steel foil. There are four, it's a taper hydrofoil. You see all the foil have four bolt holes on the top. That's how we clamp it and then bolt it to the top of the tunnel and test it. And these three on the left are composite foils. They are made of exactly the same material, carbon and glass fiber. The only difference between these three foil is the orientation of the fiber. In the middle is when it's oriented at zero degree, basically along the span-wise axis, along the spine of the foil. And what happens is if you, it's like wood. If you think about wood, if you're trying to bend it um, uh, along the uh, direction of the grain, the, it's the strongest in this direction, right? So the bending stiffness is highest versus if you're, uh, 
perpendicular to the, to the grain, then if you're 90 degrees, it's the weakest. But in addition, composite, if I lay the fibers at an angle from the spine direction, that introduces a bend twist coupling. And what happened is it will bend due to lift, right? But the bend twist coupling, if I lay the fibers 30 degree toward the leading edge, so this is looking at the free tip of the hydrofoil, and so you look, it's cantilever from the top in the back there. The red is the initial shape and the green is the deformed shape. So flow goes from right to left and you see the foil um, bending toward the suction side. You would expect that, that's fine. But what happened is also if you look at this is the nose and this is the tail and you see that it led to a nose down twist because of the bent twist coupling of the anisotropic composite. And so that actually reduced the loading a little bit and you can see the tip bending and tip twisting deformation. Versus on the right is exactly the same foil, exactly the same flow condition, but by changing the material fiber orientation, you can see that it bend it a lot more, right? So now I have about 33 millimeter bending instead of 14 millimeters of bending. And it twisted up. So you see that nose is up now. So it has a five degree twist. And so the behavior of it is completely different. And this is completely passive. So to show you how does it look like on the bottom here is the pressure distribution as well as the flow streamlines um, on a stainless steel foil. And that black outline is the initial geometry. So when it's stainless steel and when it's small, that foil is like about this yay big. And it doesn't deform much, and you expect that. And you can see that in the stainless steel case, um, it's relatively rigid and you don't have much separation. But when we do the composite, if I lay the fiber just 30 degree toward the leading edge, it's uh, more flexible, so you see it bended upward. It actually delays uh, separation and it reduces the loading a little bit and also the drag. And then on the top case is by laying the fiber toward the trailing edge and you can see what happens, the flow is completely separated. So this is the basic idea that allows us to optimize the fiber orientation angle and the material layup to delay stall. So that is important, like you guys all know about stall on airplanes, right? You can also get stall of a propeller and your lift drops, right? And you can have the same thing on turbines. So this is how we can just take advantage of material so that it automatically change shape when the low increase. And that's much easier, right? We don't need any actuators. So it's a lot simpler to operate and it doesn't cost anything, just taking advantage of material. And we can also use this to control cavitation in the uh, um, video that I'm gonna show here. So these are two foils with exactly the same geometry and the material composition is also the same between the left foil and the right foil is glass and carbon fiber. The flow condition is exactly the same. The only difference between these two foil is the one on, on the left, the fibers are laid 30 degrees toward the leading edge, and the one on the right, the fibers are laid 30 degree toward the trailing edge. So if you just look at the video, you see dramatically different cavitation patterns. You see a much, much greater cavitation on the foil on the right. Now I go, on, um, so you can already imagine the loading on these two foils are very different and the flow induced uh, fluctuations and vibration are very different. So um, in addition, I want you to hear it. So again, what we did is put the camera underneath the uh, water tunnel so that this is looking at the free tip of the left foil and the right is looking at the free tip of the right foil. So it's gonna be very noisy and I want you to hear the difference in sound caused by flow induced vibration on two foils with exactly the same geometry, exactly the same materials, tested in the same tunnel with the same condition. The only difference is by changing the orientation of the material fibers. So that's what you hear from the left side.
And that's what you hear from the right side. So you can hear that pitch difference, right? It's very, very dramatic. So we can basically, by playing with material, we can change the way it sounds. We can change the flow-induced vibration. We can change its performance. So it's very significant. So now, because of cavitation, um, I go and pause the video in a bit. So the, the problem is you have water, you have vapor, and then with ventilation, you can also have gas. So it's a uh, three phase flow. So you have liquid, vapor, and gas. And that you have a change in refractive index that makes it difficult to use optical techniques like camera to measure the deformations, for example. And also, if you're doing field applications, you're not going to tow a camera and you can, but it's you for typical operations, you don't want to do that, right? So how can we sense what is the uh, instantaneous flying shape of the body? So what we did is we developed our own in situ instantaneous, uh, basically 3D shape sensing technique. So basically what we did is put two struts inside the foil and the struts are embedded with strain gauges and with accelerometers. And we develop a method to reconstruct the 3D instantaneous flying shape. So uh, this is, uh, the movie is, should be playing. Um, let's see, let me try one more time. Let's see if this is playing now. So now it's playing. So you can see that uh, this is Casey. Um, he's now a professor at University of Iowa. This is what he did with me when he was uh, doing his PhD here at University of Michigan. You see that his the foil is placed upside down in this case, is cantilever from the root, and he's bending and twisting the foil. And you see the instantaneous reconstructed uh, shape of the foil as being uh, as being deformed. And this is very high frequency. So it basically, I can construct a fish based on this because I know the instantaneous deformation. I can also know the motion. I can know the vibration frequency and the damping. And now this technique can be used in water in very, very complicated three-phase flow. So this is the free surface you're looking at beneath. These are, I, we colored it one inch grid. And here is actually vapor. So this is leading edge vaporous cavitation. And this is actually gas. So this is a very complicated flow. This is the initial shape. And this is the deformed shape. It's actually vibrating a bit, but you can't see it much. And what happened here if you wait just a little bit, is that right there, it, the flow ventilated. So we slow this down by a lot so that you can actually see it. You remember when I say when the flow ventilated, the low and the deformation drop, and you can also see a drop in the deformation, uh, bending and twisting. So we can actually use embedded techniques to completely sense the change in flow condition and we can also use that to sense the change in structural health. For example, if you have delamination, if you have a crack, it shows up as a change in your natural frequency, and we can detect that. So that means we can tell you when you actually need to fix or maintain your structure. So um, in addition, we can also couple it with active control devices. So we use a small linear actuator and we can control cavitation. So what you see here is that if, because we can measure the instantaneous natural frequency or modal frequency of the structure, if we excite it, we just use a small linear actuator. So here's the foil and I put an actuator here. Da, 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 da. And um, we, the lift is 100 pounds and we apply a force of only about five pounds by about 5%. And it's not the force, but the frequency of the vibration. So this is, we told the foil, so this is speeding up and steady speed. If we excite it at the first modal frequency, a bubble forms. If we excite it at any other frequency, the bubble goes away. There is about a two and a half second inertial delay. So basically what you see here is bubble forms and then bubble goes away bubble off, and then what you see is uh, bubble, you see that bubble on again, and then bubble off and bubble. So we can basically control cavitation and ventilation on demand. And this is quite nice, right? Now, what, we can only achieve this by understanding of the physics, the physics of the structural behavior 
as well as the fluid dynamics. And now we can couple that with a control algorithm. So for example, this is test to demonstrate that we can control flow-induced vibration. The blue is what you get if you don't do control. At a high angle of attack, what happened is this is flow simulation. For example, at the tip, you have a large-scale vortex shedding, right? And if you look at on the top, the foil is still dancing. So the, the red is the um, uh, a common reference line so that you can compare it. Versus if we put on a controller, a saturator controller, the, if you look at that again, the foil is not dancing anymore. After a while, it holds steady. And that's why you get the red curve instead of the blue curve. So why is this important for you? So if you're riding on a vessel, you probably don't want it to be boom, 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 boom. It will not be comfortable, particularly if you're enjoying a nice dinner, right? Um, so this is what we can do by using smart materials, sensing, and control. So now moving toward where we're going, we want to embed couple of this with data-driven system. So what we want is to develop a physics-guided AI model for ship system. So why physics-guided? So you guys probably hear a lot of data-driven model. Everybody talks about these nowadays, and people even talk about investing it. Um, the, most of the models that you see out there are black box model. So they are not using equations. They rely entirely on data. Now, the problem is when you get something that is um, uh, very complicated, like what we have, um, the black box model may not be adequate because those are very specialized regimes and you may not have trained your data set for it. Another problem with black box model is it works for one ship. You don't know if it works for another ship, right? And you, and, and so there's a, and, that makes it very difficult to certify. So what we want to do is use physics-based model and more like a gray box model technique because traditionally by simulating the behavior of these um, uh, uh, hydrodynamic or structure dynamic bodies, we use first order principles, Newton's law, for example, right? F equals to MA. But, um, when we do a lot of the dynamics, there are actually coefficients that we require. For example, what is the damping coefficient? We don't really know that. So that is so-called white box model based on first principles, or you, you know, those of you who are familiar with like Navier-Stokes equation, unsteady uh, ran space equation, you need a turbulence model. So what we can do is combine the advantage of white box and black box methods. So let's say we know the form of the equation based on the physics. Now we can use the data to determine the unknown coefficients and that's how we can you develop a physics guided AI model system for ships. So the whole idea is if we have a lot of these sensors, we make measurements and then use that to drive the data driven model. That data driven model is coupled with a very fast physics based reduced order model. And then that will give us the, we can use that to infer what is the status. For example, what is the flow condition? What is the structural health? And predict how would it perform? And then use that to guide what we should do next. What kind of capability? For example, if you have a damaged rudder, can you still operate? How much, maybe you should change the routing or do you have to stop immediately and call for a backup, right? So, and then that would guide our action and then we can loop back in the loop. And we can also use some of the simulation tool as what you see earlier. For example, using high fidelity or, or low fidelity simulations to um, complement the sensor data because sometimes we don't have enough space to put enough sensors there or to process all the data. So we can use simulations coupled with real-time data collection to enhance our data sensing technique. And then we can also use the simulations to help us develop better and faster and more accurate reduced order model. So the whole idea about this is to enhance the efficiency and then to also to capture the nonlinear dynamics and critical instability. For example, if your vessel is, is about to capsize, you probably want to know before that so that you can take appropriate action, right? I'll show an example of that. 
And then also to improve the understanding of the physics, because a lot of the time when it's operating at sea, you see how complicated it can be. So we want to know what is actually going on that caused that failure. And then um, improve the design. That will also give us insights on how we can improve the design. And also tell us maybe what physics we are missing in the simulation tool and how we can improve uh, the simulation tools and, and our understanding of the physics. And, um, the, and another important thing, particularly for the industry, is that it's explainable, it's certifiable, and it's scalable. So that means you can explain to the admiral or to your boss what actually caused the problem, how you can fix the problem, or if the same problem should be expected on a sister vessel, all right? So to show you one example of that, um, we can do, so like for example, this, this is testing um, of, um, container ship at Osaka University. And uh, you see that wave? is hitting the vessel. And what happened is, as the wave amplitude is not that significant, but you can see the rolling motion of the I vessel. I'm getting afraid that one of your blame is. This is actually a parametric roll. Yes. Um, the right case you, you already saw, and that was uh, ventilation of that propeller. So all of these are actually nonlinear physics. Non you can model this as a couple nonlinear oscillator. And the equation can be as simple as what I show on the top. You have a structural mass term. You have a structural damping term, CS, and a structural stiffness term, KS. But you also have fluid terms because you have to move the fluid around you. And the challenge with the fluid mass is directionally dependent. So that's the reason why if you have a kickboard, it's a lot easier to swim if the kickboard is in a parallel direction than in the tombstone or perpendicular direction, right? So the Fluid mass also change if it's cavitating or if it's ventilated or if it's above the free surface because the amount of liquid you're moving around with you is different. The damping, of course, also change, the fluid damping, and the fluid disturbing force also change. And then you can have wave excitation and force on the right-hand side. But we can just model it, for example, as a one degree of freedom oscillation system. But we have very complex physics, like what you see here. We also have significant hysteresis effects, such as in the case of uh, ventilation. And the dynamics can be varying. Your natural frequency is changing with flow conditions. And, um, and also, we can run into chaos. So, But the beauty about having a physics-guided AI model for ship system is, for example, we will be able to tell if you have emergence of your propeller or your rudder. That's important, right? Because particularly for the propeller, if it comes completely out of the water, you lose thrust and then it will end up free spinning and it can damage your engine. If your rudder is out of the water, you will lose the ability to maneuver, right? Um, also, if you have like, for example, shaft failure, if you have a crack on your shaft, you you want to know because you want to stop operation immediately, right? And um, so we can detect that by a change in natural frequency. So if we know what is, if we have sensor just to, for example, we can put string or SRM rudders, we can determine that. And that's one of the projects that we have ongoing. Or if you have damaged blades, like uh, bent blades, or you have too much marine growth on it, we want to be able to determine that. Or if you have excessive um, flow-induced vibrations, such as um, this video is very loud, so it's actually a surface-piercing propeller. It's hard to see. You're looking at the stern side of the vessel, and you have two propellers here. These are racing propellers. And what happened is the shaft is a little bit too long, and they over-pitch the propeller. So there's a lot of shaft... Uh, um, uh, flow-induced vibration, and you'll hear a lot of noise. And I can tell you that when they tested, they first tested two pair of stainless steel propeller, and the vibration was so strong that um, it ended up, uh, it, it torn the transom. So the damage was very severe. And then they tested composite propeller, and the problem is the blade flew off. Right? So these are very dramatic failure, but the video is before that happened. So you only hear it. You don't see the blade flying off. Personally, I don't want to be on the vessel when the blade fl flies off. <laughs> So 
So I don't know if you can see and you can definitely hear the, 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 the you can actually see the vibration, the shafting a little bit. So it's definitely not comfortable to be on that vessel. So we want to know before that condition, before that will happen so that we can take appropriate action. Um, so that's example application. And now I want to show you one of the uh, recent work by uh, Shira, one of the students of mine. And he did parametric role prediction and forecast of a ship. So in head or in following seas, the water plane area, basically the area where the water surface intersects the hull, that changes quite drastically and that changed the hydrodynamic restoring force on your vessel. If the encounter frequency of the wave is twice the row natural frequency, parametric row develop. Basically, you end up rolling so much that you end up capsizing. You can actually model this phenomenon with a very simple, well, relatively simple, uh, Matthew Duffling's equation that is shown here. And um, I will show you in a little bit. And then if we have sensors, we can predict that and we can take appropriate action, which I'll show in the next case. So I wanna show you that this is a real scenario. So what you see here is a parametric rolling of a ship. This is actually from an article where you have in eight knots had seas with a wave period near 15 seconds. Uh, the APL China had a, uh, exactly the parametric roll condition and not a happy scenario with all the containers, right? Here is a video of um, parametric row. You can imagine that you probably don't want to be on that ship at that time. It will not be very fun. Um, all right, so we want to be able to predict that. So basically what you see here, the black or grayish line are the actual instantaneous data. And then our prediction, we want to determine what are the unknown system parameters. And once we determine that, we can predict it, and that's in that red line. So we already filter out the noise. And then we can use that to forecast what is about to happen. So we can basically predict parametric row before three cycles. Typically it takes three cycles before parametric row gets really bad so that you can have time to act. So basically we were able to do that. Um, we are actually looking at ways to even improve that even further so that you can take uh, appropriate actions by controlling, for example, uh, the stabilizing fins, for example. So the basic idea, what we want to do is we want to apply physics to enhance our safety and keep our oceans blue. And that's why I do a lot of work on smart marine ship systems and energy harvesting devices. So all the concepts that I cover here can also be applied to marine energy harvesting devices like marine current turbines or, um, or energy saving devices for example. So I'll end the lecture here, and I just want to acknowledge the support from Office of Naval Research. And this is in collaboration, of course, with my former student. He's now at University of Iowa. And a lot of the videos that you see there, I have videos taken at Australian Maritime College and in collaboration with um, uh, the Defense Science Technology Group in Australia. I have also taken measurements uh, videos from uh, INSEAN, the uh, Marine uh, Research Institute at Rome, Italy, and then also from Netherlands, uh, from, uh, from Marin. So um, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Julie Young, for that amazing and fascinating lecture and uh, showing how physics on a Saturday morning can be applied to anything and everything and in particular. Could I ask you at the outset um, if you could tell us a little bit about how you came to be interested in work on these problems, a little bit about the path that you took? Um. Sure, actually, uh, my it's the my path is 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 a little bit non-traditional. Um, actually, my uh, undergraduate and my master work was on structures, and then uh, when I decided to do my PhD, I wanted to I I, I figure you know like 
working at the interface is actually important. And I did a PhD in hydrodynamics and uh, it was with a professor on propellers. And so that's what got me interested in a lot of the marine devices. And then I realized I could, um, that was back then, you know, like in 2002, that we can use smart materials, like advanced materials to really uh, modify and change the design and to make dramatic improvements. And then uh, from there, I did a lot of like go from propellers to hulls to uh, turbines to energy harvesting devices. And, uh, and we have been growing since. That's awesome. So let me remind everyone uh, that you can send questions during this question and answer period to physics at umich.edu. We are, of course, live. And we do have a number of questions. So let's uh, dive into some of the questions from our viewers. Um, the first question I wanted to ask you about actually is about submarine propulsion and whether <clears throat> it's more efficient when submarines are submerged or the vessel is submerged. And if so, at what depth does this occur? Um, so of, when the propeller is fully submerged, it is it tends to be more efficient than when it's near uh, the free surface. Uh, that's because you don't have to worry about changes like non-uniformity in the inflow caused by wave effect or caused by your body motion, such as when your body is heaving and pitching. But uh, the in, but you do have cases where, like I explained, if you have a really high speed vessel, um, because the drag is uh, proportional to velocity square, is actually uh, more efficient where you, if you elevate most of the propeller assembly above the water surface, and that's called surface piercing propeller. So not always that the propeller is more efficient, fully submerged. Um, it depends on the type of the vessel, the speed range, and the loading condition. Um, uh, what was the second part of the question? Can you repeat that, please? <laughs> oh, uh, if there is a depth at which efficiency is maximized. Um, it, it, there, it depends on uh, what type of uh, vessel and what range of loading. So even when you talk about submarine vessels, you can have small ones, large ones. And that's the reason why there are so many different propulsion options. You can generally, um, if you optimize the propulsor type for that particular vehicle, you can, your, your propeller efficiency can be in the order of 70 to 80%. But if you don't have it right, you can have it really low. So I have seen propulsors where you have 40 or 50% efficiency. I see. Well, here's another propulsion question. Um, it actually references a movie, The Hunt for Red October which I remember because Sean Connery plays a Russian submarine captain, as I recall. But what I didn't remember was that they had a propulsion system they called the Caterpillar Drive, which is a magneto-hydrodynamic drive. So I wonder if you could comment on uh, whether that's really a practical thing? Um, so first of all, I, I actually didn't get a chance to watch The Hunt for Red October. That may be on my to-do list for tonight. Actually, I, I'm looking <laughs> for a good movie. Um, so, but uh, I do know people who work on Magneto Hydrodynamic Drive. Um, uh, I haven't worked on it personally, so I can't really comment about it. I also don't know what is the maximum capacity uh, in terms of power and in terms of thrust for a magneto hydrodynamic drive because I haven't worked on it. Okay, um, thanks. I'm, I have a question. We have a question from Professor Roy Clark, who's my co-host of Saturday Morning Physics this fall, and will actually host the next lecture. And he wants you to know if you would comment on the hovercraft and design issues for the hovercraft. Sure. Can I share screen with everybody so to show a slide on different options? Um, so let's see if I can go ahead and share. Um, can you guys see the screen over here? Yes. Can, so, so here, this is actually a lecture slide that I gave to my class. It gives you a sense of different uh, craft options. So you have mono hulls on the left, hydrofoil supported vessel in the uh, second 
uh, column from the left, and then hovercraft uh, third, and then the multi-hull craft uh, on the right. So the benefit of the hovercraft is uh, what you do at, with the hovercraft is you inject air um, into the uh, cushion. So you need basically seals around it to contain the air. And the objective is to lift the vessel up so that you reduce the drag. So uh, re reduce the drag on the vehicle. So um, the the, also another benefit is that you can reduce motions at high sea state. But one of the complications, there are several complications with hovercraft. And one of the one of the issue is this is a different slide, is that you have to overcome the hump drag. So this is resistance or drag as a function of speed. So before where it gets efficient is when you get into the higher speed. So your hull has to get over the hump of the wave. And so you have to have have enough power to overcome this hump drag. Unfortunately, there are limited uh, propulsion options. And I want to show you um, maybe one uh, a more detailed version. So, so here is a, actually what we call a hybrid uh, hovercraft. So, so the side hull are actually uh, rigid aluminum side hulls. And then you see these slots in the middle, and that's where you inject air. And then so the rigid aluminum side hulls are used to contain the airspace. If not, if you leak a lot of air, you lose a lot of power, right? But what are some propulsion options that you have? One is you can use air propellers, but they're not efficient, right? Because the air density is you know, a thousand times uh, lighter than that of water. Um, now, another option is you can use water jets. So this is what you see here. So you see um, water being sucked in from the entry, the elliptical entry at the bottom, and then you jack out to that nozzle uh, on the exit. Um, now, when you use a water jet, they, they are more efficient for highly loaded and high speed condition. The efficiency is low at low speed condition. Um, now, besides that, if you have uh, the, the other option is you can use a surface piercing propeller if you go, if you're lightly loaded, but very high speed, like 100 knots. But um, you start to have vibration and material issues when you uh, start to stress that. So the mechanical complexity and the limited propulsion option and the need for power to overcome the hump drag are some of the issues associated with the hovercraft. Thanks. Um, just following up on hovercraft, did they it must also have this ventilation problem and, and flipping issue that you showed with us catamaran sailing definitely actually one of the what you see from the side hall is one of the issue is that air being sucked in from the side because you have the low suction and then that will cause propeller racing and then that also changes the low on the vessel so that is definitely a uh, 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 issue with hovercraft broaching as well and then you can also have cobblestone <laughs> effects on hovercraft where the uh because of the compressibility of the airspace, you come, you end up with hopping. And then when it's hopping, the the air, the water flow into the propulsor is also not uh, non-uniform because you have mixing with air. So you have loss of efficiency as well as vibration issues associated with that. And also following up on the um, the water jet drive. So in airplanes, um, jet engines are much more common and and for any number of reasons, why don't why do ships generally have propellers? Uh, we do have water jets as well, right? So this is um, I don't I, I think I'm not sharing screen with you. So in 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 the in the um, in the early slide that I show in the lecture, there are a lot of different propulsor options. And a lot of the time you want it to be simple, right? So like if you have an open propeller, it's a lot easier to clean and inspect. But if you have a water jet, it's a lot more complicated to inspect, particularly if you have failure with the rotor, with the stator, or with the shaft. And you can remember in water, things can grow. You have marine grow. So, um, and it's difficult to clean. So those are some of the uh, issues, but there are also benefits because you have protection and you can control the streamline. You can improve the efficiency and reduce the acoustic 
emission. But you can also get cavitation issues that can cause erosion damage on the blade, on the interior, where it's not so easy to check and to detect unless you have what we're working on to have embedded smart systems sensors so that you can detect when marine grow or when cavitation or ventilation happen so that you know there's a local failure or there's a erosion and then you can repair it in time. So in addition to physics, there's biology. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Another question. This is about water salinity and temperature mm -hmm. and how you take them into consideration in your design and for example, what's the difference between a hull that you would design for the North Sea and the Great Lakes? Um, so the difference in salinity and temperature, uh, so we, we when we do design, for example, we can always uh, express everything in terms of non-dimensional parameters. And so this would affect what we so-called the Reynolds number a little bit, but, um, but it doesn't, where it really, we can definitely, the, where salinity and temperature really actually comes into play is in terms of like um, the different types of marine growth that you can have in it. It really affects the biology, right? Um, freshwater versus seawater, if you're in Hawaii versus you in the uh, Persian Gulf, for example, it's quite different. Um, and also the type of coating materials that you need in order to protect the hull, um, and it's or to protect the hull, the propulsor, the rudder, etc. And the other big difference between the, um, if you say the Great Lakes versus uh, if you're in the North Seas, is actually the wave characteristics, the wave period, and then also the wave amplitude, and that also varies between the year. Um, the influence of salinity and water temperature on the viscous, uh, on the viscosity and the and the density of the water, that is small in comparison and we can always account for that. But the influence on the coding that you need uh, in terms of the wave characteristics and also uh, it can also affect the, uh, the susceptibility to cavitation because it changes the amount of nuclei in the water. Those effects are more important. I see. So the next question is, generally about how you scale from the models to larger uh, vessels and what are the challenges in scaling. And the question also gets a little more technical in specifying how Reynolds number is accounted for in that. But maybe starting with more generally how what the scaling challenges are. So uh, the so if we just talk about hydrodynamic first, right? Uh, I want to remember that. I, are you guys seeing my screen right now or not seeing the screen? No, uh, we need to. Okay. So I I go I, I go and show uh, I go and share uh, in a, in just a little bit. But before I do that, so uh, first of all, like if we just talk about hydrodynamic without the structure first, we typically have. Uh, we need to satisfy, like, first of all, geometric similarity. So typically when we do tests, we do a scaled down version because it's a lot cheaper, but you have to make sure three dimensionally is the same thing, right? And then we, uh, we but it's actually, uh, if you look at the governing that parameter, we have Reynolds number, which is the ratio of fluid inertial force to uh, fluid viscous force. And then another important parameter is fruit number, which is fluid inertial force to gravitational force because you have wave. But it's not possible to satisfy both of them simultaneously. So we typically like wave effect tend to be more important. If we have cases where viscous effect are really important and if we want to study that, what you can do is you can separate the two phenomena. So for example, I can like, if you only look at the submerged part of the hull, I can make a double uh, a image of that. So if you think about a semi cylinder, I can make the full cylinder and test that whole cylinder in, in a wind tunnel. And that allows me to satisfy Reynolds number similarly, but uh, so I can get the viscous effect correctly, but I cannot get the effect of wave. So if I want the effect of the wave, then I have to test it in a towing tank or uh, 
in in a, in a towing tank facility where I can generate wave and see that effect. Now another challenge is that if you run into a cavitation effect, then you have to depressurize the whole facility because typically when you have a towing tank, for example, like the towing tank at University of Michigan, it's a 110 meters long. But even with that length, we can the maximum speed that we can achieve is only about uh, six point two meter per second, and the reason is because you gotta accelerate, and then you get your steady speed, and then you decelerate. You're not gonna run into the wall, right? And our steady state time is only about two seconds at the maximum speed. So if you want even higher speed, you need a longer tank, and they become even more expensive to operate. So that's one of the challenge. Another challenge is that if uh, if you just do in a water loop, for example, it's hard to generate wave. That's one thing. Uh, it, it is possible. An another uh, challenge is that you need a if you want a larger scale model, so that you know when you have wave, you don't get reflections from the boundaries. Then you need a larger cross section. A larger cross section with a high speed. That means you need a very massive pump, and you need a massive amount of power. So uh, let me share a uh, screen with you. Um, the and and particularly cases where uh, you need to worry about cavitation. So we can't typically do tests at a high enough speed such that cavitation can scale properly. So uh, what I'm, I, can you guys see my screen right now? Yes. So this is actually a recent test that I conducted at the depressurized wave basin at Marin. So this, uh, 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 basin, wave basin, is 240 meters long by 18 meters wide by 8 meters deep. And this whole thing is in a pressurized vacuum. So we pull the pressure down to only 2.5% of the atmosphere. Um, so let me, I think they have a video and I was linking to it. So give you a sense of how do you do the testing. Um, I hope, is this showing the YouTube video? Can you guys see it? Yes. Yeah, so you can see the wave being generated and then they have a towing carriage that you can tow the vessel. And the reason why is you see the dome type of platform. Did we lose Julie? All right, it seems that we lost Professor Young momentarily. We'll give this a few seconds to see if she comes back. I lost audio earlier. Yes. All <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> you're back. So um, why don't we, um, <clears throat> we do have a few more questions and, and we had a wonderful set of questions today. So if you don't mind. Um, so here's a question uh, that is back to biology maybe. Uh, would you please explain again how fish propelling motion was utilized to enhance maritime propulsion? Um, so if you look at the, the the fish, you have fins, right, and you have the tail. Um, so it's so we you can the fin and the tail, or even the shape of the body of the fish, is very similar to the cross-sectional geometry or foil. You can think about the foil, the wing, the rudder, or the control surfaces on a marine vessel. So you can see a lot of similarity to that, but we, you don't, for large scale vessels, so like if you talk about submarine 
or if you talk about an aircraft carrier, you don't see a flapping fin as the primary propulsion mechanism because the power required will be too high. So you see typically screw propellers, right? Um, but when I was talking about similarity to fish, what I meant is because if you look at a fish, it's, it's self-aware. So it knows its surrounding and it does that because it has like the neuro the the neural mass so that it can is effectively displacement and pressure transducers uh, sensors and we can put the same thing on a vessel so if we know what is if we actually know the changes in sur surrounding flow and the changes in flow condition like if you have marine growth cavitation ventilation wave then we can actuate we can uh, actuate uh, with devices like with control devices so that we can improve the performance of the vessel as a whole. And that's what I meant. I see, that's great. And uh, one last question, and it also relates to the sensors, is how would a strong role be defeated? How do you intervene? So uh, you you can have stabilizing fins. So basically, if you think about, you can stick fins on the side and you can actuate it, then you can um, uh, stay, that generate forces on the side that can counter the row motion. So it is possible, but you need to know it ahead of the time before. Uh, so it doesn't work if you already uh, uh, if you already very near capsizing, right? So you have to. the The important thing is early warning and early actuation. I see. That's cool. So. Great. All right, Professor Julie Young, thank you so much for the great lecture and for engaging with us in this question and answer period. And uh, it's really been great. And thank, thank you, you everyone. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in today. I want to remind you that our next Saturday morning physics lecture of this fall 2020 season is November 14th, four weeks from now. It will be Professor Alec Thomas from the University of Michigan's um, College of Engineering. And he will give us a lecture entitled The Light Fantastics, which will tell us about the world's most powerful lasers. See you then. Thank you.